Good morning. Welcome to the wrong side of the tracks. The visionary writing of Angela Carter was magical, funny, frightening, subversive. Her creations were darker and wilder than anyone before her had dreamed. I think she opened imaginative doors and said, this is possible. What big teeth do you have? All the better to eat you with. The girl burst out laughing. She knew she was nobody's meat. But Angela Carter's refusal to compromise made her a lonely figure. She really was like nobody else. And in many ways, she did things first before any of the rest of us did. Every woman writing now has a debt to Angela Carter, whether or not they have read her. I look at those Disney films like Frozen and I think, who's given Angela Carter's estate 10%? She invented the princess who turns things on their head. She turned it all inside out. She was absolutely ahead of her time, and that's why we're so interested in her now, because she's coming into her time. This film brings to life the fabulous visions of Angela Carter. Her wild women, her fearless heroines, and, with the help of her diaries and letters, the most marvellous place of all, the world inside her head. OK, I write overblown purple self-indulgent prose, so fucking what? Children do not stay young for long in this savage country. There are no toys for them to play with, so they work hard and grow wise. But this one, so pretty, and the youngest of her family, a little latecomer, had been indulged by her mother and the grandmother who'd knitted the red shawl that today has the ominous, if brilliant, look of blood on snow. And far away, in a great southern city, lived another little latecomer. Angela Stalker, born in 1940, was the baby of her family. When she was 12, her brother wed a woman named Joan. That's me getting married. There's Angie. She just looked fat, I'm afraid. Tubbs. They called her Tubbs, she said, which was unkind, but then children are. Angela's mother didn't help. Olive Stalker saved up her rations to feed her only daughter treats. At the age of eight, I thought she needs to let her go. She's not four now, she's eight and it was difficult. But she went up to the loo, she had to leave the door open and things, you know. Her mum really treated her as if she couldn't manage if she weren't there. I mean, Angela's mother treated her as a sort of doll. And her mother cosseted her and looked after her to a fairly weird extent. And this basically robbed Angela of any sense of agency. We had no idea she was going to become a novelist, really. But she always had plenty of imagination, did Angie. By her first year of high school, Angela had lost herself in the dark world of mythology. Thebes, ancient capital of Egypt, deep in slumber lay, sleeping against the sorrows of another day. The priests in the temples chanted psalms and praises. Amen Ra, the voices cried. Amen Ra, we thank thee greatly. Another night has died. Angela began to rebel and wrestle control of her life from her mother. She decided she was going to get slim and that made all the difference. I'm not going to be this fat tubs 
that everybody laughs at at school. Melanie grew to fear the bread pudding. She was afraid that if she ate too much of it, she would grow fat and nobody would ever love her and she would die a virgin. The gargantuan Melanie, bloated as a drowned corpse on bread pudding, recurred in her dreams and she would wake in a sweat of terror. Such was the, the force of her mother's protectiveness that she had to react very strongly against that and had to form a personality very consciously in opposition to her mother's values, in opposition to the kind of nice, polite little girl her mother wanted her to be. So she deliberately became sort of raucous, sacrilegious, sweary. One Christmas, everything was going very smoothly until Olive brought in the turkey and Angela said, Oh, that's a fucking good turkey. Whereupon everything stopped for a long time while Olive wept a lot and ran around. And Angie had done it on purpose. I mean, she did stir it. Her rebellion in full flight, Angela began marching, campaigning for nuclear disarmament. She refused to go to university and began instead to search for a man. She found one in the shape of folk-loving beatnik Paul Carter. And to the horror of her parents, on the 10th of September 1960, Angela Stalker became Mrs. Paul Carter. She was 20 years old. But in fact, she landed herself in another sort of prison, she thought, really, with Paul. The young newlyweds moved to Clifton in Bristol and lived in this flat. Paul got a job as a chemistry lecturer. Angela started her new life as a housewife. In 1961, she began keeping a journal. November the 12th. A vile day. And Paul goes all in drawn into one of his massive infantile sulks. I go all to pieces and cry and cry and get completely submerged by self-pity. I just go on and on bruising myself against his stolid, brutal silence. His indifference. The way he doesn't look up when I come into the room and doesn't smile at me. And doesn't make any response to anything I say. He's self-righteous as shit. I'm unhappy enough to die. I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. Well, these are what she called journals. It says here, journals, 1, 1961. So when she was 21. The journals have never been published. Her literary executor, Susanna Clapp, retrieved them in 1992 shortly after Angela died. This is very typical of them, that she cut things out and put them on the covers, as a teenager might, really. These early ones are much more descriptive and descriptive of her daily life. There she is, she's got a cold. I become very self-centered and self-pitying with a cold and take to smoking peppermint-flavored cigarettes and lying around. But it is unusual to find her making, as it were, semi-domestic notes. That's not a genre that you think of, you connect with her, or that I connect with her. In 1962, the young housewife became a student, studying English literature at Bristol University. Over the next two years, she read over 200 books, but her plan was to write. What I want is a voice, something personal and unmistakable that people will instantly recognize and say, that's Angie. But to Angela, the literary landscape was a dry and barren place. What's weird in the 60s, there's a lot going on that's exciting, radical, different and new, but it's not happening in the novel. 
I think the novel's really boring in the 1960s because it's so busy um, trying to tell life as it is instead of thinking of itself as an imaginative form, you know, able to just make everything up. Why don't you marry her if she's a nice girl? She's already married. You are in her bloody fix, aren't you? For Angela, married life was her own kitchen sink drama of drudgery and frustration. Because the kitchen floor was dirty, I forgot to wash it. Because the dresser shelves were dirty, I forgot to wash them. It never ends. The buggering about with dirty dishes, coal pairs, ash bins, ship bins, hot water, detergent. There is no stop for me, no rest. Never again. On and on and on. But Angela was never one to conform. She escaped into circles ever more bohemian. And there she met a kindred spirit. Corinna Sargood, who would illustrate some of Angela's books. If you were issued with something as hideous as a Zimmer frame, you too would do something about it. It's got sadder and sadder. <laughs> like Corinna, Angela adored the fantasy worlds of her childhood. Fairgrounds, vaudeville, puppets and popular entertainment began to inspire her work. It set her apart from the rest. Everybody was going into real life. It didn't seem to be doing them any good, real life. And there were lots of extremely miserable people around us. But simple misery was never the Angela Carter way. We both we're very dismissive of a lot of women writers who are writing about um, living with men who are really quite awful to them and having to, you know, the meal was never eaten because he couldn't be bothered to come home and she, the scraping of the meal into the bin. You know, you say, well, why? Allegory seems much more powerful than um, describing what's happening to you in your kitchen and your dreadful disappointments. Angela developed a lavish writing style, rich with imagery. The Magic Toy Shop is the story of Melanie, a naive young girl who is sent to live with her controlling uncle, a sadistic puppet master. She'd been fond of Pally for a time. Now she herself was on stage with an imitation swan. The swan settled its belly on her feet. She felt it. Looking up, she could see Uncle Philip directing its movements, his mouth gaped open with concentration. She noticed that his black bow tie had glossy spots in the fabric, which caught the light and shone. She shifted under the rustling swan, whose wings now beat strongly, stirring her hair. A daisy blew away. She could see nothing after this, except the flowery glare of the spotlight. The Magic Toy Shop was written over the winter of 1965 to 1966, when her marriage to Paul Carter was going through a very difficult period. He was going through the first of his major depressive episodes. And she was beginning to think about leaving him. She said that Uncle Philip, the kind of patriarchal toy maker, was an exaggerated version of Paul Carter. Almighty Jove, in the form of a swan, reeks as well. Uncle Philip's voice, deep and solemn as the notes of an organ, moved dark and sonorous against the moaning of the fiddle. The swan made a lumpish jump forward and settled on her loins. She thrust with all her force to get rid of it, but the wings came down all around her like a tent and its head fell forward and nestled in her neck. The gilded beak dug deeply into the soft flesh. She screamed, hardly realizing she was screaming. She was covered completely by the swan, but for her kicking feet and her screaming face, 
the obscene swan had mounted her, she screamed again. There were feathers in her mouth. She heard the curtains swish to amid a patter of applause and thought it was the sound of the sea. During her marriage to Paul Carter, she wrote a novel a year. She wrote five novels between 1965 and the end of 1969. And she said that that was a product of neurotic compulsion. In other words, she went to it as a refuge from her difficult personal life. When it came to inspiration, nothing was out of bounds. Comic books, sci-fi, psychoanalysis, folk song, she was taking the wider culture and borrowing from everywhere. I mean, she was like a literary version of, of Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Arts Club. She just thought, I'm having it all. But one thing was holding her back, her marriage. As I try and grow, as I submit myself to change, to help him, as I make allowances and act tenderly and do all the things a good wife should, my fucking understanding, my kind heart, so I am building a better and stronger cage for myself. Every day. And in every way. Writing was Angela's route to freedom. Her book, Several Perceptions, won her the Somerset Maugham Award and £500 to spend on travel. Which is how, in 1969, a few months short of her 30th birthday, Angela took a holiday on her own to Japan. In 1969, Tokyo was a city in flux, and Angela experienced it as a surrealist dream. So Fellini had decided to remake Alphaville. Up the road, there is a poodle clipping parlor, a Pepsi Cola bottling plant heavily patrolled by the fuzz, a noodle shop which boasts a color TV, a mattress shop which also sells wicker neck pillows of antique design, a dispenser from which one may purchase condoms attractively packed in purple and gold paper trademarked young jelly, and a swimming pool. With the students up in arms against American imperialism, it seemed to Angela that anarchy and desire crowded the streets. Angela's engagement with Japan, I think, made her who she was. She was interested in that kind of writing, which, which took the real world and, and turned it into a carnival. Cloud palaces erected themselves, then silently toppled to reveal for a moment the familiar warehouse beneath them, until they were replaced by some fresh audacity. A group of chanting pillars exploded in the middle of a mantra, and lo, they were once again street lamps, until, with night, they changed to silent flowers. Giant heads in helmets of conquistadors sailed up like sad, painted kites over the giggling chimney pots. Hardly anything remained the same for more than one second. And the city was no longer the conscious production of humanity. It had become the arbitrary realm of dream. With Paul back home in Bristol, Angela was only due to stay in Japan for six weeks. She ended up staying for two years. And it was all because of a chance encounter with a wannabe writer named Sozo Araki. She was in a coffee shop. Sozo insisted that it was Angela who initiated their interaction by smiling at him. And then they went to a sushi restaurant. And then after that, they went to a bar. And then they went to a hotel, a love hotel. Um, in Shinjuku area, yeah. That was the beginning of the, their tumultuous relationship. Mm -hmm. 
I sense in him an extraordinarily tragic potential. Indolent, filthy, often unshaven. His beard, by the way, if he let it grow, would grow in the perfect shape of a hero in a Japanese film. He is so beautiful, so variously beautiful. She wrote a letter saying, I'm never coming back to Paul. Please don't try and make me, which I had no intention of doing. Um, but please keep an eye on Paul. I mean, he was deeply shocked. But the fact he didn't really understand shows why she left. Within two weeks of meeting Sozo, Angela decided she would live in Japan and make a go of her relationship. But her lover had other ideas. Sozo was a, a player, and uh, he had other women, probably one night stands or semi one night stands. But he was unfaithful. Yeah, that's for sure. Lipstick on his underpants. Dear God. God, I never had that trouble with Paul. I wait with bated breath to see what surprises next week may bring. I shall probably discover residual traces of a Mars bar in his anus. The affair was over, but Angela remained in Japan. She got a job as a hostess in an upmarket bar catering to Japanese businessmen. The experience was interesting in an intellectual way, but disgusting <laughs> as well, because, you know, they had to feed a Japanese businessman as if they were babies, you know, like, um, eat it, like this. One customer's English was limited to the single word masturbation, which he pronounced very frequently with a singular relish, while another grasped my thighs quite unexpectedly and then announced, I want you tonight. It is no good turning wrathfully on the poor things and crying, what do you think I am, a prostitute? They know you aren't a prostitute. And at first she blamed Japanese women. But in fact, she realized that, no, it was not them. It was a society. You know, it's a patriarchal world. And uh, Japan is a sort of a exaggerated example. Exaggerations of women seemed entrenched in Japanese culture. Angela became fascinated by kabuki theater, where the roles of women were played by men. Angela Carter found it very intriguing that the ideal femininity in Japan is a male construct. It's a staged, fabricated femininity. And, and that made her radicalized as a feminist. In 1972, Angela returned to Britain. I wanted to write what seemed to me a deeply, deeply serious novel, piece of fiction about gender identity, about our relation to the dream factory, our relation to Hollywood, our relation to imagery. Angela's next novel revealed that the ideal woman was never all she seemed. The Passion of New Eve has as its heroine somebody who's been completely constructed by the rules of the cinema, really on terms quite strictly of what men want from goddesses. How that face is created from the raw material, how it's invented like a piece of cookery, really, a piece of oak cuisine. Tristesa, enigma, illusion, Women? Ah. And all you signified was false. Your existence was purely notional. You were a piece of pure mystification, Tristessa. 
the story of Tristessa is, of course, that somebody who is as perfect as that couldn't possibly be anything but an invention. And it turns out that she's, in fact, a chap, really, underneath it all. Of course, it's inevitable that, in a sectarian way, I'm more interested in women than I am in men. I mean, I'm sorry. I think lots of people have been interested in men. <laughs> Angela wasn't on her own. In 1973, there were more than 60 feminist groups in London alone. The women's lib movement was out in force. Why are you dressed like this? This is International Women's Day today, and you sent a male to interview me and a male cameraman. Where are the old women cameramen at the BBC? I think how Relation to the women's lib movement was slightly complicated. I mean, she wouldn't have hesitated, of course, to call herself a feminist, but she wouldn't have signed up to a women's lib march, I think. Never one to join a club, Angela said she preferred to snipe from the sidelines. In The Passion of New Eve, New York City is under attack from a radical group, the women. Our anti-hero, a womanising young Englishman, is kidnapped by a female cult, led by a many-breasted mother goddess who forces him to have a sex change as punishment for his misogynistic crimes. Angela wasn't taking the women's lib movement entirely seriously. And richly, hugely, she began to be again. She announced herself in thunder. I am the great parasite. I am the castratrix of the phallocentric universe. I am mama, mama, mama. Again, the chorus took up the hiccuping yowl. Ma, 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 ma. Crashing in archaic waves over the clamor of the trumpets and the hosannaing. And she keeps coming and going like a trick of vision. Her voice oscillates like an audio hallucination. Satirical, lurid, with a transgender heroine. The Passion of New Eve is regarded as a modern classic. But on its release, the reviews were scathing. When I realised that there were no limits to what one could do in fiction, I stopped being able to make a living. It marked the beginning of my obscurity. I went from being a very promising young writer to being ignored. She was writing a different kind of thing that people didn't quite know what to call. And guess what? They still don't quite know what to call it because it's pretty unusual and, you, let us say, unique. She was her own thing and, and she was not a compromiser. Down on her luck, Angela took on commissions as a freelance journalist. She lived very, very frugally. I mean, the royalties were tiny that she was getting. And when she did articles for the Radio Times or Cosmopolitan or New Society or the New Statesman, this was a lifeline. And she said that uh, 75 quid for an article in the Radio Times keeps the house warm for a couple of weeks. The big changeover happened, I think, in the 70s and 80s when more women got into publishing. And in 1973, Virago arrived. Its mission? To publish books by women writers. And in Carmen Khalil, Virago's founder, Angela would find a trusty ally. Typical Angie. Happy birthday, but will you respect me in the morning? She really wasn't one, wasn't she? That's me, and that's some useless man I'm beating around the head with a whip. It's just a non-feminist feminist joke, isn't it? Carmen coming along, Carmen and people involved with Virago, what they wanted was a company that would understand the value of women's writing and actually bring it back and push it out there. I got published in paperback by Virago first because I got rejected by all the other ones. <laughs> Silly old them. <laughs> In the early days of Virago, 
Angela was the first writer Carmen commissioned. She said, I'll write a book for you, and this is what I want to write about. I said, absolutely wonderful, we'll do it. The Sardian Woman was a work of non-fiction that took everyone by surprise. After all, the Marquis de Sade seems unlikely inspiration for a feminist. Sade, an unusual man, aristocrat, atheist, sodomite, novelist, old lag, dramatist, flagellant, glutton, and master of black humor, this man who was capable of inventing the most atrocious massacres felt sick when he smelt the blood from the guillotine. The Sardian woman takes two of de Sade's characters as its starting point. The chaste and virtuous Justine, who obeys the rules of a society created by men and becomes its victim. And her sister, the villainous Juliet, who exploits her sexuality, indulging in a sadistic array of vices and becomes monstrously wealthy and powerful. She was always looking at um, women's sexual desire. She felt that it was boundless, that women had appetites that were not met, that women used their sexuality because they could use so little else. But always she was saying, look, women have agency, women have power, even if we don't realize it, especially sexual power. Whatever else he says or does not say, Saud declares himself unequivocally for the right of women to fuck. He urges women to fuck as actively as they are able, so that, powered by their enormous and hitherto untapped sexual energy, they will then be able to fuck their way into history, and in doing so, change it. OK, these are the reviews for the Saudian women. For some reason, Miss Carter has been wildly excited by de Saad. And like an earnest student, she recounts the plots of his major novels with gusto, while apparently forgetting what point it was she originally set out to prove. I fail to see why she has tried to harness Saad to the cause of women's lib, capital W, capital L. And within the women's lib movement, many were baffled too. The Saudian woman got her into trouble with the sisterhood in a big way. And everyone said, Christ, you can't say you like pornography. You can't say you like Saad because it's all about the degradation of women. Everyone thought, what's she doing? She thought that literature mustn't be a sort of comfort blanket. It must be transgressive. And so one of the things that attracted to Saad, he's, he's sticking two fingers up at the establishment and he's beyond the pale. But what her critics missed was that in the Saudian woman, Angela was arguing for something fundamentally human, for men and women to love and be loved as equals. She had a problem with her sink, under the sink, whatever those things are, pipes. And um, Mark came to fix it. I mean, he came from what Angie would describe as a working class family. He was extraordinarily beautiful and tall. Very, very, very silent. Mark Pierce was a 19-year-old construction worker from Bristol. Angela met him when she was 34. He smiles. He lays down his pipe, his elder bird call. He lays upon me his irrevocable hand. His eyes are quite green, as if from too much looking at the wood. There are some eyes can eat you. Her story, The Earl King, is a version of a German folktale about this sort of malevolent woodland creature. And Angela's version of The Earl King is based certainly physically on Mark. He has the same green eyes and long hair, and she wrote in her journal, Mark is der Erlkönig, which is the German word for The Earl King. Your green eye is a reducing chamber. If I look into it long enough, I will become as small as my own reflection. I will diminish to a point and vanish. I will be drawn down into that black whirlpool and be consumed by you. She was um, unnerved by how deeply she was falling for him. 
Um, she wanted to stay in control of herself. Within weeks of meeting, Mark moved into Angela's house. They would stay together for the rest of her life. He allowed her to, to be imaginatively free. He dealt with most of the housework and he sort of grounded her. He kind of looked after her um, in many respects. It was a, an unconventional relationship in many ways. During those early years, Mark and Angela had a long distance relationship. Angela was still struggling to pay the bills and accepted a teaching job in Sheffield. I think we had grand plans to be sort of a commune. But... We had an assortment of people living in the house from the time we moved in. Yes, but I, I was slightly amazed. I was very surprised when she asked if she could live here. At the time, she was, mm. she was considered a good writer, but she wasn't sort of famous or didn't sell a lot. So she was struggling, really, financially. But there was another time when a box of books arrived. And I said, Angela, there's a box of books arrived for you. And she said, oh, dear, that's so embarrassing. They're remainders that I haven't sold, so I've bought them up. <laughs> but in Sheffield, Angela found the path that changed her fortune. The city was 13 miles from the small village where she had lived during the Second World War. She'd been evacuated there by her grandmother, a formidable working-class Yorkshire woman. And she was a storyteller too. When my grandmother used to tell me the story of Red Riding Hood when I was a very little girl, um, she believed in ending it on um, the wolf eating Red Riding Hood. And when she came to the bit where it says, and then he leapt upon her and gobbled her all up, she used to leap upon me and pretend to gobble me all up. And I thought this was wonderful. I thought this was quite ecstatic. I used to squeak and shiver and, and say, oh, Granny, Granny, do it again. Angela began writing fairy tales of her own in her grandmother's voice. Of all the teeming perils of the night in the forest, ghosts, hobgoblins, ogres that grill babies upon gridirons, witches that fatten their captives in cages for cannibal tables, the wolf is worse, for he cannot listen to reason. You are always in danger in the forest, where no people are. What Angela Carter did with the fairy tales was take the stories that we all know and turn them inside out, make it into something which gave women back the power. What big teeth you have. She saw how his jaw began to slaver and the room was full of the clamour of the forest Liebestot, but the wise child never flinched, not even when he answered. All the better to eat you with. The girl burst out laughing. She knew she was nobody's meat. When I opened the bloody chamber for the first time, it blew my mind. With one bound, she was free. And that is the end of all of those stories, how, how women are freed either by going into the difficulty or by killing the big bad man. She laughed at him, full in the face. She ripped off his shirt for him and flung it onto the fire in the fiery wake of her own discarded clothing. I just thought it was a masterpiece. You know, I, I, just, think, I just thought that was one of the most extraordinary books I'd ever read, and, and I still think so. Five, four, three... The Bloody Chamber led to numerous publicity appearances, but not everyone was entranced. The novelist Angela Carter has just published some fairy stories. I read the whole book. I thought her stories are beautifully written. But on the whole, I don't really like stories of fantasy. I like stories that begin, Mrs. Henderson walked slowly into Sainsbury's <laughs> and purchased a pound of cod. Just to say, I'd like to know the Sainsbury's where you can buy cod. <laughs> <laughs> the Exeter one. You yeah. fantasist. <laughs> Fantasist is what most people considered Angela Carter. They were missing the point. I think my work is very, very deeply political. A lot of people don't. Um, that's fine. I don't mind. I like creeping up on people behind and sandbagging them. 
um, with an idea that maybe they hadn't thought of for themselves. Because I am a deeply political person in an old-fashioned way, I believe all art is political, that you can't walk down the street without making some sort of political statement. I think people writing about Angela haven't picked up on the strong streak of socialism which she had. And indeed, when people would try and cast her in the role of some fae, you know, fairy godmother, she'd say, you know, damn it, I'm not interested in fairies, really. I'm a socialist. That's why I'm interested in this stuff. You know, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the point is to change the world, not to have fantasies about it. Ian Dorry, you've chosen Bird of Night by Susan Hill. I've chosen Bird of Night because I think Susan Hill is one of the most outstanding talents in contemporary English fiction. Well, Angela Carter. Well, I think it's a nice middle-class novel about a nice middle-class nutter. <laughs> a clash of opinions is on the well, yeah, yeah. No, not really. <laughs> um, I was deeply offended by one or two things in the novel. One is um, the private incomes on which um, these two chaps um, subsist. Julie Cooper. I thought I thought he actually made the the genius character absolutely brilliant. I I, I mean she did. I, mean, I, thought, I thought it was it, it was a real. It seemed like a, a real writer. Or they might write like Virginia Woolf. I can't. I don't know. I think the Bloomsbury group are a lot of tinkling, overprivileged freaks. She would sometimes come out at the top of her voice with the most extreme kind of statement just to see what would happen. We went to see Swan Lake at the Hippo in, uh, in Bristol and in the interval we were in the bar and she deliberately turned up the volume on her voice and said, well, when you get down to it, this story is really about a man who goes around fucking swans, isn't it? She'd do it just to see what would happen, you know, or a dinner party. Suddenly she'd use the F word or the C word and she'd have that slight half smile on her face. The Alfred Eyre is going to open my eyes as to the true nature of women in love. Uh, that's by D.H. Lawrence, of course. Gudrun is the very castratory lady <laughs> who absolutely slices through all those men. I truly, like, she is like the vasectomy queen of, 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 of the West Rye. I Jesus. Angela's frank approach to other people's fiction turned her into a cult figure. And it was with this formidable reputation that Angela arrived at the University of East Anglia where she was unleashed on a group of unsuspecting, creative writing students. We were terrified of being judged by her, and also, or I was, and also there was a magnificent sort of tension then in your sentences as you thought of her looking at them. But one day, the students faced another daunting prospect. They had to read out their work in front of Angela and the entire class. The very first class that we had with her and, and I presented the opening chapter of this book, which I was calling Dump. And one of my fellow students said, it appears this teenage boy lives on a rubbish dump. I find that slightly hard to believe. And Angela said, when a reader opens a book, she enters into a contract with the writer. And the writer's only job is to stay true to the rules of the world as established. And that was brilliant. You create that world, and if you do it convincingly, the reader comes with you. So it was, an, it was enormously liberating. This year's winner, The Gathering, by N. N. And of Angela's hundreds of students, some achieved literary fame. Described by the judges as an angry novel. Every time I sit down to write a new book, I do something that Angela Carter told me to do one way or the other. Flip it, do, do exactly the opposite. Whatever you're thinking, just think the absolute opposite. In 1984, Angela transformed a short story from the bloody chamber into an ambitious screenplay. The Company of Wolves, her skewed take on Little Red Riding Hood. Is that all you left of her? I think her time was coming. I think people were waking up to the particular voice that she had. In a Carter-esque twist, it wasn't just the wolf who drew blood. Jesus, what big teeth you have! All the better to eat you with. Angela's surreal take on sexual awakening helped make the film a critical hit. 
that her wildest heroine was about to take flight. Nights at the Circus, an exuberant yarn about an extraordinary performer, Sophie Fevers, a mighty trapeze artist with one unique trait. This leading lady has wings. I stood upon the mantelpiece and I gave a little shiver. The carpet looked further away than ever. But then, thinks I, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And behind me, truly, sir, upon the wall, I could have sworn I heard, caught in time's cobweb, but all the same audible, the strenuous beating of great white wings. So I spread, and closing my eyes, I precipitated myself forward, throwing myself entirely on the mercy of gravity. The heroine is a, a trapeze artist. She's called Feathers because she has wings. Um, the main question of the book is whether her wings are real or false. If the wings are a prop, then she's a wonderful aerialist. If the wings are real, she's a freak. And it's a question which proposes itself to, quotes special women. Are you more interesting because you're a freak or because you're a fraud? Feathers has wings, but in order to earn a living as a performer, has to pretend that they're not real, that she can't really fly. And Angela thought of this as representative of how women have to hide a lot of their true potential. The spiralling tornado of Feathers' laughter began to twist and shudder across the entire globe as if a spontaneous response to the giant comedy that endlessly unfolded beneath it, until everything that lived and breathed everywhere was laughing. To think I really fooled you, she marvelled. It just goes to show there's nothing like confidence. Nights at the Circus received glowing reviews and was tipped to win the Booker Prize. But it wasn't even nominated. What won was Hotel du Lac, which was Anita Bruckner, which is an insipid novel by any standards. You will have noticed, Harold, that in my stories, the unassuming mouse always gets the hero, causing the sultry temptress to retire, baffled. The tortoise, in other words, wins. It was typical of the way that the establishment at the time rewarded women who are compliant. And there was Angela Carter, who was just kind of wild and in your face and doing what she wanted and she didn't care. And I feel that it was a deliberate rejection. I don't think it was an omission, I think it was a rejection. Angela had faced humiliation at the Booker Prize before. A year earlier, when Selena Scott failed to recognise her at all. Adam, can I ask you what you think of the choice of the winner? I was one of the judges. Does that exclude me from this? <laughs> I'm sorry about that. What's, uh, what's your name? Angela Carter. Hello. Yes, tell me, what do you think? Uh, it's a very powerful and impressive novel. Um, was it your choice? Um, you shouldn't ask a question like that. Why ask not? Clay. Why ask not? Clay. Ask Clay, because, because we, have, we have a consensus. <laughs> I see. It would be seven years before Angela published another book. In the meantime, her life was about to transform again. She was in her 40s, you know, when she had Alex. And she just really couldn't believe it. Those are all Alex and Angela and Alex. Mark, <laughs> Alex. Alex, 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 February 84. Mark and Alex, me and Alex, and the Aga. She really did love being a mother, and uh, very much. <laughs> Beautiful little boy. Long ago, women got their children by digging around in the earth. They'd often pry the children loose from the ground. They wouldn't have to travel far to find little girls, but often they'd have to dig deep to get boys. She wrote only one novel after Alex was born. 
that compulsion that she had throughout the 1960s where she was producing a novel a year certainly dissipated as she, as she became happier. By the time Angela returned to novels, the landscape for writers had transformed. With a new breed of superstar author commanding staggering advances of over half a million pounds. Because readers had fallen for a growing literary movement. Fiction with magical themes. He was hovering high over London. Ha ha, they couldn't touch him now. The devil's rushing upon him in that pandemonium. A lot of us who were coming up at that time in the late 70s and the early 80s were kind of in love with her work, you know, and, um, and enormously uh, kind of enabled by it, gave us permission to be kind of wilder and more inventive. It was against this backdrop that Angela pitched the most ambitious idea of her life. Ah. This is Wise Children. This is her synopsis. Wise Children will be a long comic panoramic novel and we'll use the theatre as a metaphor for British society over the last hundred odd years. Its subtext, evidently, is the general inefficiency of patriarchy. As her publisher, Carmen negotiated Angela's advance with the head of the company. She was aiming for a six-figure sum. Angela is a writer who will sell for years, I believe. Basically, I think she wants to know and get her market price. Angela wants to know what we think she's worth. Not much, according to Carmen's boss. I'm allowed to offer 60,000. Yes to 60,000. Not in love with it. Keep the offer on the table. I wish I'd been born later on and hadn't, hadn't had to put up with this shit. So for an advance of £60,000, Angela spent the next four years writing Wise Children. She was saving the best till last. Good morning. Let me introduce myself. My name is Dora Chance. Welcome to the wrong side of the tracks. It's very unusual in giving the narrative to a working class woman. And Angela was famously said, whenever I read a novel in which there's a comic charwoman, I throw the book across the room with a flood of expletives because it tells me everything I need to know about the person who is writing that book. That was absolutely the opposite of what she did in Wise Children. Wise Children is the story of a pair of dancing twins. The Lucky Chances, Dora and Nora Chance, whose talents take them from the boards of London's Music Hall to the studios of Hollywood. But as they grow older, their fortunes wane. The Lucky Chances faced the music and they danced for well nigh half a century. Although we would always be on the left-hand line, hoofers, thrushes, the light relief, you might say. Bring on the bears. Or bears. Our careers went down the toilet along with the profession itself. There's a section in Wise Children towards the end when the girls, who are now in their 70s, dress up for a party and they, they put on the faces they used to have. They're very conscious of recreating themselves. I mean, in fact, because they're now batty old hags, they recreate themselves as grotesque parodies of the girls they were. But in a sense, they know perfectly well that even when they were girls, they were grotesque parodies of the girls. They really were. Show business, being a showgirl, is, is, is a very simple metaphor simply for being a woman, for being aware of your femininity, being aware of yourself as a woman and having to use it to negotiate with the world. It's every woman's tragedy, said Nora, as we contemplated our painted masterpieces. After a certain age, she looks like a female impersonator. Mind you, we've known some lovely female impersonators in our time. But shortly before the book's release, 
Angela received some devastating news. I'll never, ever forget it. I was sitting in my office in Chatter and Windus, and the door opened, no appointment had been made, and in came Mark and Angie. And they were standing in front of me, in front of my desk, and they said, we've got something to tell you. Decades of smoking had taken their toll. Angela had cancer, and there was nothing anyone could do. Mark is bearing up. We're all bearing up, in fact. Fuck it. We watch a lot of videos, bed rest and rich food. She was incredibly stored. I once phoned her, and her, halfway through the conversation, the doorbell rang. And she said, hang on. And she answered. She said, oh, he wasn't, he was a man without a scythe. So that was all right. Continue. <laughs> She spent all of her time digging up the ground. She dug and she dug until she came out on the other side of the earth. Two weeks after writing her will, Angela and Mark were married. Well, we just heard that she had lung cancer and that I did this as a wedding present for her. I hoped it would convey how I understood and I was very sad about her illness. The fact that you're not here to see the cherry tree next year doesn't mean the cherry tree's disappeared. It means the cherry tree's doing its own thing in its own space and time, and that's how it should be. Mark was wonderful when she was ill. You know, you couldn't have had a better person, and he looked after her incredibly well. I mean, it must have been absolutely terrible, because Alexander was eight when she died. Angela Carter died at home on the 16th of February, 1992. She was 51 years old. It was a horrible shock. People that you think are gonna be with you for the next part of your life are just suddenly not. She had a lot of writing years left that she was not able to use. So she is one of those people about whom you imagine, what would she have done? Angela would have had a lot to say about the things that people are exercised about right now. The monstrosity of men was always a subject for her, you know, and she, she, knew, she knew very well what men were capable of, you know, and I think, um, I think in a way, you know, the, the title story, The Bloody Chamber, um, if you read that, I mean, it's as good a description of Harvey Weinstein as it's possible to get. <laughs> I think Angela Carter's everywhere. You don't need to see her. You don't need to have read her. You don't need to think you know anything about her. When something is powerful enough, it has an indirect influence. Above all, it's about freedom. You know, that's what women are fighting for above all, isn't it? Freedom. And that means imaginative freedom. Freedom to dream yourself into a different possibility. She helped us do that. Well, next Saturday, we unravel the story behind Sylvia Plath's seminal novel, Inside the Bell Jar, that's at nine here on BBC Two. But next, he's been at the top for 25 years. We celebrate the glittering career of Alan Partridge.